Well, good evening, and uh, welcome to this evening's Protect and Webinar. Uh, we're joined by a host of naturopaths and integrated medical physicians tonight, nutritionists, as well as I noticed uh, many students, which is uh, very pleasing. In fact, um, we've had to expand the meeting room to accommodate and fit you all in. I think this speaks to the fact that many of us now are becoming aware of the growing evidence base uh, and research that's pointing to the links between chronic disease and chronic inflammation, of which LPS is proving to be a major player. So as an allied health practitioner, 30 years or so of uh, clinical experience, I hope to share with you tonight some insight into oral immunotherapy, chronic inflammation, and how this can help you with your patients. So our learning objectives uh, this evening. So first of all, just uh, that quotation there from Bruce Butler, and we'll talk about him a little more uh, later in the presentation. But if we think uh, of the immune system as a machine, then we're far from even knowing all of its parts. And I think that's a a very true statement that uh, this um, um, immunologist has made. So tonight we want to get a, a, a further understanding of chronic inflammation, how it links to disease, updates and knowledge on the research that's linking LPS uh, translocation to chronic disease, and also discuss anti-LPS antibodies and their role in liver health and chronic disease management. So let's begin by reminding ourselves about inflammation, specifically chronic inflammation. It's a response by the immune system to either segregate or remove the damaging stimulus and help facilitate a healing resolution. Now I think that's the key thing for us as practitioners is to remember that uh, anti-inflammation is not pro-resolution. And uh, so inflammation is how we heal. It's, it creates an environment that's conducive to healing and repairing. Uh, it increases the blood vessel permeability, priming the immune function, and attracting immune cells to that region for repair. So it's how we heal. Um, but acute inflammation must switch to resolution. And when it fails to do that, chronic inflammation then can result. And this can lead to cellular dysfunction and damage. So it's important to remember that, that uh, we're, we're really trying to encourage a pro-resolution state. It's part of the reason why we know from research that um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, for example, will reduce energy, that will reduce pain, but they hinder the healing process and delay tissue repair, because they're blocking that inflammation. So whilst they're having an analgesic effect, uh, they're also unfortunately reducing the amount of uh, immune cells in that area that are able to do the repair. So merely blocking or suppressing the inflammatory process may not yield the best long-term results. It's far better to assist the revolution, uh, resolution and to prevent the chronic inflammatory state from developing in the first place. With that in mind, it, it's only as recent as the last five years that we had ago that we had the discovery of SPMs, those specialised prorate resolution molecules, such as resolvins and protectants, uh, that have given us a new understanding of how acute inflammation then is switched to tissue resolution. Without that step mediated by the SPMs, that inflammation then progresses, that acute inflammatory response uh, doesn't resolve and it progresses onto a chronic inflammatory state. An interesting point for us to remember too is that, and to note is that the precursors for these SPNs, the biosynthesize in the body, are actually our omega-3s. This sheds a little bit of light on the role of DHA and EPA in tissue healing in inflammatory conditions. And I guess it's yet another reason why we keep recommending green leafy vegetables uh, and even chia seeds. Chronic inflammation is, is a recognised factor in the etiology and pathogenesis of chronic diseases that we're seeing every day in clinical practice. So let's, let's talk now a little bit about LPS and its role, lipopolysaccharide. 
It's an endotoxin that's located within the cell walls of gram-negative bacteria. And LPS is one of the most powerful bacterial virulence factors in terms of its pro-inflammatory properties. We used to think not too long ago that uh, the bacteria only released its LPS endotoxin um, on destruction. But we now know that it's actually releasing small amounts of it ongoing through its normal metabolism and its normal bacterial activities. And each spectrum contains approximately 2 million molecules of uh, LPS endotoxins. LPS, lipopolysaccharide, is a primary agent used to induce, used to evoke inflammatory responses in clinical research. So you'll see from these uh, you know, snapshots here that we can see lipopolysaccharide induced inflammation. In, in mice, in animal studies, induced in, uh, in livers, in lung tissue, multiple organs. So when we're looking to uh, research or explore and investigate inflammatory responses, we actually use LPS as a, as a means to induce that and evoke it to be then studied. So it's, it's well recognized as it, for its uh, inflammatory activities. So LPS endotoxins, the effects in humans, uh, what effects does that have? It targets um, the cardiovascular system, uh, impacting on the heart and the lung functionality, promoting that cytokine uh, cascade with the release of chemokines, pro-inflammatory cells, uh, your cytokines, leukotrienes. So it has a, a deleterious effect on, on the human anatomy um, and quite quickly uh, affecting the ventricular function, uh, pulmonary gas exchange, um, uh, blood vessel permeability. It's releasing those inflammatory mediators, uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha, the interleukins. And it's also activating the fibrolytic system, which modulates the degradation of clots um, as the body is repairing and replacing that damaged tissue. Uh, and this regulates uh, the, the degradation of fibrin clots uh, and the cellular components um, to, to then down to soluble degradable products. It's also activating and priming the uh, phagocytic lymphocytes, getting ready, if you like, for that inflammatory uh, response to be enhanced, getting ready for that battle. Uh, the coagulation pathways are also activated, um, generally with uh, aggregation of platelets, dilatation of blood vessels, uh, increased leakage in, um, in new vessels. So this is the sort of um, hemorrhagic state that we, we observe in, in uh, bacterial infections that are as a result in part to the uh, LPS endotoxin activity. Serum LPS, elevated levels, have been associated, associated with, a, with a multitude of metabolic diseases, conditions, insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease and liver diseases, such as uh, fatty liver, and NASH, non-alcoholic steratic hepatitis. So how does it, LPS endotoxin get into our, into our circulatory system? Well, there's three main routes. Uh, the first being the most obvious is direct skin access, you know, a cut. Um, the bacteria and its endotoxins can get in there. And what we're seeing then is the uh, resulting endotoxic shock that can occur, that syndrome, uh, septicemia, blood, blood poisoning. Secondarily, uh, our leaky gut. So again, another barrier has been, um, has been breached, that epithelial barrier, and we have LPS endotoxin leaking through, translating through that uh, barrier into the portal uh, hepatic circulatory system. And the third one, which may not be as uh, obvious to some of you, is through gum disease. Now, dentists have for a long time uh, known about the links and the research the links between gum disease, uh, gingivitis, and 
cardiovascular disease and chronic diseases. So what's the connection here? The oral bacteria and what's the factor? It's LPS. So the LPS is building up that bacteria. It creates a tartar and that tartar is a biofilm allowing for the bacterial activity to damage the gums and gives direct access then to the bloodstream for the LPS to trigger chronic inflammation. So good health begins at the gut, the digestive system begins, sorry, begins at the mouth and, and the digestive system and the processes begin there. Um, we need to be keep, keeping good dental health and thinking of that as we think about gut health as well. The inflammatory responses to LPS endotoxin. LPS is a, is a biomarker of the T, of the T cell activation. Uh, chronically activated T cells will cause the immune system to, to attack itself and resulting in that autoimmune dysfunction, leading to autoimmune conditions and diseases. So the inflammatory response is mediated through the release of the interleukins uh, various uh, cells, factors, which in turn stimulate then the production of prostaglandins, the leukotrienes. LPS activates the macrophages and can then also, also um, uh, enhance phagocytosis and cytotoxic, uh, cytotoxicity particularly within the liver, within the macrophages that cook for cells there. They're then stimulated to produce further lysomal enzymes, interleukins, tumor necrosis factor and, and cytokines with an upregulation of interleukin 10, which has a, uh, a um, anti-inflammatory activity. So it's a, at the balance between that pro and anti-inflammatory that is regulated through the innate immune system and also the, uh, the Tregs as well. So how does the LPS receptor bind? This is uh, going back to the immunologist Bruce Butler. It was back in 2011, I think it was, that uh, he was jointly awarded the Nobel Prize for discovering the toll-like receptor 4 pathway and its binding complex or LPS. Um, so it's only been mapped out in, in fairly recent times. Um, I think the body to date has identified, I think we've identified 10 toll-like receptors. And if I'm not mistaken, I think they're still trying to work out uh, what uh, the 10th toll receptor actually does, what its actual function is. We can see from the schematic here that the, um, the LPS is, is binding that like receptor 4 and MD2 uh, complex at the cell wall. Um, now that uh, complex there is on a number of immune cells and uh, triggers and activates uh, transcription and signaling of pro-inflammatory cytokines, interferons, and also transcription of uh, the um, uh, factors and um, promote inflammatory responses, as well as T and B cell activations. So in humans, this activation of uh, inflammation through LPS is it's being sensed, um, sensed by the toll-like receptors, and that's leading to the transcription and synthesis of our inflammatory cytokines. So in humans, the LPS binds to the lipid binding protein in the serum. That transfers it then over to another protein, which is a uh, pattern recognition receptor, uh, CD14, and that sits on the cell membranes, which in turn then transfers it to another protein um, called MD2, which is a monocyte uh, differentiation antigen. And that associates then and binds, uh, locks in, if you like, with the toll-like receptor, uh, number four. This then triggers the signaling cascade. Um, cells then start to secrete the pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, nitric acid, uh, that lead to that endotoxic um, response or shock. 
So we see these uh, receptors present on, on several cells in the immune system, uh, including macrophages, uh, dendritic cells. And in um, monocytes and macrophages, the events are triggered during that interaction with LPS. So once inside the body, the natural defense cells, like macrophages and monocytes, will recognize that bacteria and its LPS as foreign. And this process then, uh, through the O antigen of LPS, um, the bacteria can sometimes evade uh, destruction, but normally we're able to destroy, destroy it in our defenses within the immunity. The endotoxins that are located within the bacteria then released into the circulation, and that's when they start to have their uh, physiological effects. The defense cells then in the body um, release substances, stimulate pathways, and start to compound the negative effects of the endotoxins. We're seeing on the right-hand side here the production of cytokines, interleukin-1, uh, 6, 8, tumor necrosis factor, platelet act um, activating factor, all of these key players in that cascade of cytokine, chemokine um, uh, response. Prostaglandins are also, leukotrienes are in turn uh, stimulated, and, and, and these are all powerful mediators of inflammation. Um, the LPS activates the macrophages, stimulating the release of the lysomal enzymes, particularly interleukin-1, which is sometimes referred to as an endogenous pyrogen, um, and also uh, upregulation of interleukin-10, which has an anti-inflammatory effect. We also observe with LPS the impact on, on histamine, the histamine response as well. So the complement cascade um, causes that release of histamine, and we know that's a major effector of that allergic response, causing vasodilation and inflammation. This slide uh, is just showing the rapidity of the acute phase of inflammation. We can see here that LPS endotoxin yeah, upon release, within an hour, just over an hour, we're starting to see the cytokine responses here. So it's really quite a quick uh, process. You know, the pathogen rec recognition receptors, LPS here, and then cytokine cascade. So that's enough, I guess, on the uh, the chemistry, the biochemistry of it. Um, hopefully I haven't got too, too technical there. We can sometimes get a bit bogged down in that. But I think the net thing for us to start to realize is LPS contributes to intestinal permeability. What we know, and we're known as, um, as natural therapists, uh, nutritionists, integrated medical physicians, and call leaky gut. And I think, you know, it, it was a nice uh, theory going back uh, a decade or so ago, but we didn't have any but we had a paucity of robust evidence to support its uh, validity as, a, as an actual um, process. And I think now that the, the, weight of, um, the weight of evidence has really sort of brought this to a fore, that we're seeing leaky gut as being recognized as a, as a phenomenon. So this increased permeability um, allows that translocation of LPS into that portal circulation, where it then enters the, the, the filter, then the liver, and triggers an inflammatory response. If that LPS is not neutralized by that liver um, and the cook for cells, and it's not prevented into entering uh, into the systemic circulation, it then triggers an innate immune response at multiple end organs, brain, central nervous system, skin, joint, pancreas. So if it's able to get through the liver, overwhelm the liver, it's now got access, free access to all the end organs. So detoxification of gut-derived LPS is a vital function of liver macrophages. The innate immune system in the gut serves as the bridge, really delivering uh, signals from the tract, from the GI tract, to the systemic immune system. 
In fact, the enteric nervous system of which it's communicating with has as many neurons um, as the spinal cord, and we're calling it the second brain. Um, the gut mucosal immune system is the largest lymphoid organ in the body. And it's, it's designed to differentiate the uh, antigenic signals against that high background noise of food and bacterial antigens. So despite the constant antigenic stimulation, suppression of inflammation is the rule. It's, it's always trying to, to dampen, to quiet down, maintain that homeostatic state. There are a lot of components in that gut immune system and which we've already mentioned, some of the dendritic cells, epithelial cells, natural killer T cells, uh, the intra, um, epithelial lymphocytes, M cells, and others that serve as signals um, from the lumen uh, across through into the enteric nervous system, then communicating with the systemic uh, central nervous system and the systemic immune system. If we look here, we can see a bit of a, a pathway to systemic inflammation. In the top left-hand corner here, we have uh, the dietary component, sometimes referred to as the SAD diet, the standard American diet, which is really now being linked with uh, gut dysbiosis uh, and creating a, um, an imbalance in our gut microbiome, which in turn then leads to a obesity, um, leaky gut, whereby the endotoxin LPS, the gram-negative bacteria, is able then to translocate, to pass through into the portal system, circulatory system, and triggering now an innate immune response and getting through the liver and into all end organs and systemic inflammation is triggered. So we've got growing uh, research now that's linking LPS to, to multiple chronic diseases. If we look here, a little snapshot of some here. We've got um, uh, LPS linked here with um, with uh, depressive behaviour in mice. Now, I always thought that was a bit curious as to you know how do you tell if a mouse is um, is depressed? But apparently, I'm, I'm I'm led to believe it's a measure it's a measurement of the number of um, tail wags that they have. So we can see that it's linked here with uh, diseases of uh, the central nervous system. We can see that it's um, also linked with chronic fatigue and pain. Um, it's implicated in uh, hyperalgesia due to the LPS sensitization of nociceptors. The central nervous system um, effects with LPS uh, on serotonergic uh, receptors that can impact on uh, depressive states. And this is something that we as practitioners commonly see as a comorbidity in chronic disease, is that depressive state. And LPS is, is shown to have a um, significant impact on uh, the serotonergic uh, receptors, of course, of which we, we know that neurotransmitter uh, manufactured in the gut, about 80% of it, it is uh, contained within that uh, GIT. We can see here the uh, activation of the, uh, the transient receptors here that uh, are involved in pain and nociceptive and pain signaling. Uh, this is in trigeminal sensory nerves. In chronic fatigue syndrome, the conclusion was that the results indicated the dysbiosis of the microbiota in this disease and further suggested in, uh, instance of translocation, microbial translocation, which can play a role in inflammatory symptoms that we see in chronic fatigue. So we, we're seeing now that connection. It's starting to, to be clearer for us as practitioners. It's something that we've instinctively known, I think, intuitively, that the gut health is, is linking with a lot of the conditions that we're seeing um, that are often syndromes uh, rather than diseases. They're a collection of symptoms. We're seeing also its connection here with the, um, with the central nervous system, uh, Parkinson's disease, 
there's uh, some interesting research in this space. I know that uh, Imuron is in preclinical studies in, uh, in, um, with autism. And LPS is actually toxic to dopamine in the brain and causes um, uh, dopaminergic neurodegeneration. So we're seeing here higher levels of intestinal LPS in Parkinson's disease. We're seeing uh, autistic um, patients who have um, significant dys, uh, dysbiosis and, and LPS present there as well. So it's really leaky, leaky gut equals leaky brain, that uh, brain gut axis. Um, neurological conditions, dementia, cognitive decline. It's only in recent years that we've discovered the immune system, uh, sorry, the lymphatic system in the brain, the glial lymphatic system, what's referred to as the glymphatics. So it, it was only up to recent years we didn't think that the brain actually had, uh, like the rest of the body, a, a lymphatic system, a, a means of removing metabolites and waste material. We now know that it does, and that's only been very, very recent years, within the last five years, that uh, we've actually seen that. And in multiple sclerosis patients, the characteristic Dawson's fingers, um, which were being observed radiographically and were a hallmark for uh, MS, um, now we know that it aligns, they align with the lymphatic vessels that we didn't know were there. But interesting fact is that the lymphatics, this glial lymphatic system, is activated during sleep. So this is where we see another connection, another penny drops it, the importance of sleep for health, the importance of uh, the impact of uh, sleep um, quality and degradation of sleep on chronic disease. We're not getting uh, a washing out of uh, those buildup of metabolites. So this is why sleep is, is very important as a, as a health initiative. So let's talk now about the new player in, in the game, if you like, um, to address this LPS issue that we're now becoming increasingly aware of. You know, I would say two, three years ago, when I was talking about LPS, it really wasn't in the vernacular of many natural therapists. You know, we had an awareness of it, but it's now really coming uh, to, to the forefront in our thinking and, and our connections with uh, disease processes and chronic disease. So protectin is an anti-LPS antibody. We refer to it as uh, IWM I24E. So when you see that in, throughout this presentation, that's synonymous with uh, protectin. And it's composed of uh, the adjunctive uh, immunoglobulins, many of them are glycosphingolipoids, and there's a dual effect of protectin. It was shown to be synergistic in animal uh, models, studies that we did on uh, diabetes and liver disease. And this demonstrated an enhanced effect of the oral administration of uh, the anti-LPS antibodies with the immunoglobulin adjuvants as compared to when we looked at them separately. So those immunoglobulin adjuvants are in the carrier of the colostrum. So it's the colostrum that uh, we have enhanced uh, to um, carry the anti-LPS antibodies. The colostrum itself has some of its own intrinsic immunoglobulin effects and uh, we're probably all well aware of it as practitioners um, separately. So its action in protectin is based on the promotion of the regulatory uh, T cells, which can suppress inflammation at the site of the disease without inducing a generalized immune suppression. So together with the anti-LPS antibodies, it's altering the gut microbiome. And we're immune modulating um, by promotion of the regulatory T cells, the Tregs, uh, natural killer cells. And so again, the cells that are involved are dendritic cells, um, natural killer cells and epithelial barrier cells.
So immunotherapy, oral immunotherapy is a term that's now being uh, in, the, in the literature quite a lot and, and it's a very, very active area of medical research now, uh, looking at using the immune system and enhancing, modulating the immune system to uh, promote um, health impacts. So protectin is a spot weeder, if you like, um, specifically targeting the harmful bacteria. Oral immunotherapy is based on that inherent mechanism in which the GI immune system inhibits or promotes that reaction towards orally administered uh, antigens, antibodies, uh, adjuvants. So that the immune system, that gut immune system, has that unique, unique ability to differentiate between harmful antigens, which induce inflammatory response, and non-harmful epitopes, which can induce tolerance. Dendritic cells, as well as innate cells, are all involved in this process, this homeostasis, this balance. So oral immunotherapy is now becoming a, a platform for a wide range of diseases. And um, with limited side effects, um, good safety profiles and, and uh, toxicity. And it's not associated with a generally immune suppression. And that's what we see has been the approach we've taken with a lot of, uh, a lot of pharmaceuticals is to immune suppress so that we're reducing that, that um, generalized immune response. Um, so we don't have then the side effects of risks of infection, severe infection, and opportunistic bugs, and so forth that we see um, with patients that are uh, immunocompromised um, pharmaceutically. So oral immune therapy targets that innate immune system, um, sending signals to the systemic immune system, promoting regulatory Tregs, uh, suppressing inflammation at that site, um, creating a specificity of effect, um, that's dependent around the site of the inflammation. It's also targeting the gut microbiome. Um, so it can affect um, then metabolic diseases, syndromes, by altering the balance between the pro and anti-inflammatory inducing cells. So protectin's direct protective mode of action is to, to neutralize the toxin, the endotoxin LPS, suppress its germination, its ability to adhere to the gut wall, reduce its motility and its ability to colonize, to form those biofilms, which is another term that we're starting to uh, see commonly in, in the literature. An indirect mode of action, protective mode of action, is the inhibition of um, uh, the toxin's ability to, to induce the inflammatory signaling, uh, the anti-inflammatory effect by stimulation of the uh, immune response, enhancement of the epithelial barrier function, uh, inhibition of the uh, apoptosis, the, the death of uh, epithelial cells, and the prevention of biofilm formations. So this is becoming a, a novel approach, a, a new approach to targeting pathogenic bacteria. It significantly reduces, protecting, reduces the adherence of uh, CFA1, which is a colonization factor antigens, to produce uh, ETAC, uh, enteric uh, toxigenic E. coli strains. So they're able to uh, stop them colonizing, uh, binding, adhering, forming, forming colonies and, and bio, uh, biofilms. They reduce the motility of those strains through the soft agar, um, and, and also the the binding not only to the bacterial surface, the cell wall, but also to its flagella, which is a highly bacterial virulent factor in bacteria. Um, and it's been shown to have a, a lot greater reactivity against the purified uh, ETEC um, flagella antigen than uh, immunoglobulin G purified from just non-immune uh, ordinary uh, colostrum powder. So that's a, a point of distinction that we've been able to show in preclinical pre studies. So this um, slide here shows some electron uh, micrographic imaging that, uh, that we did 
And I think it quite, um, quite graphically demonstrates just the impact that protectin has here and its action on pathogenic bacteria. So this was done on um, uh, E. coli bacterium. And we can see here on the left that uh, without the protectin, that the E. coli bacteria are able to adhere, colonize, and bind. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, with protectin, with the anti-LPS antibodies, its action is to bind, uh, preventing adherence and uh, releasing of the LPS, and then allowing this to be eliminated by the body. And this action, the, the, the protectin action, the anti-LPS action, is entirely intraluminal. And so that means that the um, pathogenic bacteria, they can't infect uh, and colonize. And it's all happening within the uh, lumen. And later on, we'll, we'll show a little bit on uh, some recent studies that we've done, some human studies. Uh, and one of the findings that we had is we were able to prove, we had a proof of concept that uh, the protectin antibodies did not cross into the bloodstream. And I think that's a, an important factor for us to be aware of. We're seeing here the cross-reactivity. So the protectin was um, formulated with 13 strains of E. coli, and it was proven to be cross-reactive with 180 uh, strains of gram-negative bacteria. And these included E. coli, uh, Klebsiella, uh, Salmonella, uh, Campylopyra, a number of different ones. And the American De Defense Department um, actually did a report and a study. And what they did is they looked at samples of infected personnel from um, Cambodia, Thailand, Southeast Asia uh, over the past 20 years and stored samples and then tested their reactivity, ability to cross-react, bind those strains. And we were successful in all 180 strains. And as a consequence of that, the, uh, we're in collaborative research with um, the military uh, in, in this um, regard. So protectin's antibiotic uh, action here, we can see that there's a translocation here, a cytokine pro-inflammatory activation, and then with the antibodies here, the tight junctions being bound, we're not getting translocation, so we're not getting activation. So a lot of the LPS-mediated diseases that we see in daily practice, irritable bowel, leaky gut dysbiosis, fatty liver, which is becoming an increasing problem, leading on to fibrotic states, NASH, which we'll talk about in a moment, metabolic syndrome, autoimmune conditions. Protectin removes that gram-negative bacteria endotoxin, uh, restores the intestinal tight junctions, prevents the translocation entering into the portal bloodstream, helps to restore microbiome balance, and enhances probiotic activity. So what are some of the systemic effects here? We can see that uh, IWM or I24E protectin here in the blood. Um, we've demonstrated in research and in multiple studies now, animal and human, that uh, insulin resistance is reduced. Serum LPS levels are significantly reduced. Um, we'll show some graphs on that in some human trials in, in a moment. Uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha reduced. T rates are, are increased. In the liver, we've, um, there's uh, activated uh, macrophage cells. Uh, liver inflammation is reduced. And we've also demonstrated the uh, AST and ALT, the liver enzymes, have been reduced. We've shown LPS reduction in uh, the intestine, which then results in a, um, a decrease in permeability and uh, an increase in tolerance, uh, immune suppression. So the blood, the liver, the gut, uh, multiple systemic benefits uh, in modulation of the immune responses and inflammatory responses. We also just completed a preclinical trial and going into phase one now of one of the world's leading um, gastroenterologists in, in um, Switzerland. And uh, we can see here that it's shown promising colitis, 
Um, the, these are animal studies where we've shown that it demonstrated a reduction in colitis in, in, uh, in mice. The oral administration there promoted Tregs, alleviated bowel inflammation in immune-mediated colitis, uh, suggesting that the microbiome is a, a target for Tregs-based immunotherapy. And that's what uh, Protectin is. And this is a patented platform. This is a unique platform. It doesn't exist uh, anywhere. We are leading the way in this technology. So it's a new direction in, in liver health. Um, it's a first step in toxic clearance. You know, I think that in, in some regards, this analogy that I, that I often give is that like a toxic room. What we've been doing as practitioners is we, we've not really known what the toxins have been. You know, if I go back a decade or so as a practitioner, we know that there's been um, auto-intoxication of the bowel and the toxicity. Um, but we haven't been able to identify those main ones um, specifically, such as LPS. And we've wanted to go into this contaminated environment, not really knowing what the toxin is, uh, and try to, we're trying to sort of combat that at the same time as repair the room and the damage, um, you know, the wallpaper coming off and the, and the paint being damaged. So we're trying to repair that at the same time the toxins going on. We, we really don't know what it is. Uh, we haven't got any real specific um, therapeutics for it. So we've been using probiotics and glutamines and, and you know, vitamin D and we're all doing it all at once. And, you know, we're, it's, it's a real hit and miss, and uh, we're struggling a bit, I think, out there in practice. So what we have now is we've got a new tool in the bag, if you like, uh, where we're able to now clear that toxin, specifically target it, and, and see that as an essential first step in treatment. And so I like these little fellas here, because you know, I think in lots of ways it sort of depicts what what we've been doing for a while, and, and yet here we have maybe, you know, a new innovation that's going to make our, our job a lot easier. I certainly know I wish I'd uh, had this available you know, uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago. I think it would have made um, practice a lot easier in, um, in terms of clinical outcomes. And so protecting is the only product, the anti-LPS, that directly re removes LPS toxins. We've got the supporting human trials here uh, that uh, show serum reduction and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. This was uh, some images we took out uh, of fibrotic liver in MASH. And these were mice, uh, mice livers and some studies that we did. And we showed that the fibrotic liver here, when induced with LPS, so injection of LPS to induce fibrosis into the liver, and then the protective effect what happens when we have the antibodies present. We can see that without the antibodies present, we, we progress to the predictable inflammatory and fibrotic changes, and yet we have protection here when uh, the antibodies were present. So that's quite a graphic um, uh, illustration, I think, of the um, organ effect in the liver. So the liver really is that first target. You know, when we have altered uh, gut permeability, increased um, permeability, uh, that um, goes straight into the portal system, and it's the liver that needs to deal with that. Um, we have a buildup of SIBO um, and increased uh, translocation of LPS into that portal system and the release of pro-inflammatory. So this is a, a first-in-class mode of action, LPS antagonist, yeah, which is what protectin is. And... Um, so we have a, a world first in this form of immunotherapy. We have here, it's going back to that systemic um, slide we had earlier, the obesity in the diet, uh, creating a dysbiosis, uh, and a healthy, obesity, uh, that healthy diet leading to the obesity. And we have a, an epidemic of obesity now in our, in our Western diet um, and in developed countries, leading to a leaky gut, which translocates then the LPS into the portal system, the crypto cells of the liver, activating on the receptors, pathways, the toll-like receptors, 
hepatocytes, which then inflames, creates fibrosis, leads to the fatty liver, which then can lead in many instances to NASH, fibrotic liver, which then leads to cirrhotic liver and liver failure, eventually liver transplantation required or failure or uh, carcinoma. So here there's just looking at some of the pathophysiology of that. The injury, the insult uh, from a number of mechanisms, LPS being uh, one of them, um, alcohol, viruses, a number of them that then evoke a, the inflammatory processes uh, relating to fibrotic state and cirrhotic. So those blood-derived uh, antigens, as I said, including LPS, uh, really disrupt that homeostatic balance between suppression of inflammation, tolerance, and cytokine cascade. The cookpa cells play that crucial role in those macrophages, and, and the liver has ability to deal with a certain amount of LPS that's coming through, uh, translocating. It's when it becomes overwhelmed that, that we have the problems. I'd like to talk just briefly on the latest um, trials that were done, the human trials, and this was done, uh, Principal Investigator Professor Ron Sorrell, who Sanyal, who's a leading authority, if not the leading authority in the world on liver disease. And uh, we, we uh, completed stage 2B trials, uh, 133 biopsy proven NASH patients enrolled in this uh, over a number of sites uh, inter uh, NASH internationally. And uh, in this we were able to demonstrate significant uh, changes and improvements in uh, liver function reduction in uh, CK18, which is a, a key biomarker for liver cell damage. So in the serum LPS rates, we look here at uh, patients that had a, a greater than 15% decrease, so that being the, uh, the end point, 64% um, and 59% in the two treatment arms at the different dosages as compared to placebo. So statistically significant reduction in serum LPS levels. ALT levels here are greater than or equal to 30% decrease. Again in the two arms, comparison to placebo, significant reduction in ALT enzyme liver levels. And here subjects with greater than 30% decrease, again, significant difference. So in summary here, those test re those results, which are now entering into phase three. So this has been about 12 years in development to get to phase three drug uh, development, uh, which will be another three to five years. And uh, we have um, a demonstrated, we have to demonstrate a, a, an ex exceptional safety profile, decrease in serum LPS making it the first ever LPS antagonist drug candidate. In the, in the, uh, the NASH space, uh, there are about five candidates worldwide now that are entering into phase three trials, of which Imiron and uh, IMM124E is one of those. We demonstrated significant reduction of CK18, no change in the uh, hepatic fat fraction, which we expected, um, we're looking at uh, that uh, the antibodies don't have an effect on the stereotic effect uh, in NASH. And we showed no crossing and translocation into the blood. So the action's entirely intraluminal on the bacteria before it's able to translocate in and then trigger all of those cascades we've been talking about in inflammation. Let's, uh, let's move into some of our current therapeutics. Let's look at what, what are we doing out there today in practice. Pharmaceutically, uh, when we're dealing with inflammatory conditions, whether they be arthritis or immune conditions, uh, eczemas, we're typically using non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or prednisone, cortisones, or immunosuppressants, um, plaquenols, methotrexates, agents that suppress that immune response. So their mode of action is primarily anti-inflammatory. If we look at it from a dietary supplement, 
perspective. Here we the players tend to be, you know, curcumin, turmeric, uh, marine oils, fish oils, EPA, vitamin C's, uh, glucosamine. Again, their mode of action, anti-inflammatory. Herbal, if we look at herbal, uh, herbal um, products, uh, Habica phytum, devil's floor, uh, boswellia, ginger, you know, it's a, it's a, in Chinese medicine, we use ginger as, as primary, one of the, the go-to herbs for any forms of arthritis. And again, they, they all share the same mode of action. The difference is that the dietary supplements action anti-inflammatory is a lot weaker. So we don't have um, the acute adverse effects that we see with the stronger pharmaceutical anti-inflammatories. So this is this is a point of difference, as I see, that protectin is is a clinically proven first ever LPS antagonist. It's working upstream. That is before the inflammation is being triggered. Now that's not to say that these um, these agents don't have a role to play. Of course they do, because they can uh, modify the symptomatology and mitigate the inflammatory response, um, symptomatic response and so forth. But if we can go one step within the gut to really go upstream and stop that triggering of uh, the cytokine cascade in the first place, then that's certainly desirable and preventative. I've given here a bit of a bit of a clinical protocol outline. Uh, we know LPS in the intestinal tract promotes the inflammation um, when the gut particularly is compromised, um, say for low sick levels, for example. We see high levels of intestinal LPS in patients with irritable bowel disorders, um, which then creates further inflammation, becomes a, a cycle. And it also create, creates uh, opening of those tight junctions, leaking in that barrier. Um, LPS can, can do that with or without lectins. So I think the first step if we look at this as a protocol is to identify and eliminate that uh, LPS toxin, endotoxin, um, using um, the antibody such as protectin to target it specifically. We can move on to then correcting the dysbiosis preventing biofilms and reducing allergens and dietary and environmental factors. Uh, we can move then into supporting that liver and gut health uh, using some of our um, some of our nutraceuticals, herbals, um, silimarum, for example. Um, it's interesting we just touch on silimarum. You know, this is probably our go-to um, therapeutic herbally for, for liver health. And yet when you really look at the science, the evidence there and the research to be done on it, it's actually of poor quality. Most of it's animal studies. Uh, most of them are fairly poor uh, designs and uh, low numbers. There was indeed one that was fairly robust. It was done in um, hep C patients who had liver damage and there were two arms of dosage of psyllium island um, and it was well designed, fairly robust. Uh, the conclusion was that the psyllium island didn't have a significant um, statistically significant effect of it if they failed. It's not to say that it hasn't got a role to play, but if we just look at the cold hard science, we've got an anti-LPS antibody that now has demonstrated um, in multiple studies and in, in, in a uh, human trial its, its benefits on liver health versus what is currently something that we've, we've relied on empirically um, uh, that really is inconclusive and conflicted in, in a lot of the research and is a positive research and quality research in it. And that's just an interesting side point. We can then move into increasing antioxidation, uh, glutathienes, uh, isoflavonoids and so forth, uh, healing that epithelial barrier and then restoring that microbiome. So it's very important that we see that uh, protectin and, and anti-LPS is, is used as part of um, protocol, integrated into what we're currently doing. Don't view it as a panacea. I'm certainly not sitting here saying, you know, oh, this is, uh, this is the holy grail. Uh, what we are, what we do have now is we have access to a new, new therapeutic that we haven't had previously that incorporated into a, a protocol 
um, I think it's, it's going to really make our job with our patients a little easier by clearing and eliminating that um, toxin load. So I see this is sort of a, a fundamental protocol that we could follow in chronic inflammatory conditions. I've got here a copy of the um, Gut Health Restoration Program. And this is available through Oborn um, in e-copy, which you can, you can print off and use with your patients. It just gives a little bit of an, an outline. It can fold in half into an A5 A5 um, size and gives you a bit of a, just a bit of a template for use with your patients with a symptom diary here and a legend there. Uh, working on that first phase, that phase one, first three to four weeks, um, just focusing on clearing and mopping up and eliminating that toxin, that LPS. From there, we can then move into the gut repair. So once we've cleared that phase and we've got those loads down, move into the gut repair phase. Um, rather than sort of being hindered or battling the two while we're, whilst we're trying to repair, a little like that toxic room environment um, scenario. And in this, you know, some practitioners have a preference for, for various uh, therapeutics. Um, you can continue using some protectant through this phase to keep the LPS levels under control. And this is where we start to titrate in probiotics. One of the problems we've seen with probiotics is the indiscriminate use of them. If we go back 20 odd years or so, we, we only had uh, three scientific papers on um, on probiotics or on the microbiome. You know, last year alone we had over two and a half thousand. You know, it's become one of the most medically researched topics on the planet Earth. And of the thousands or more species that we know, we've probably only really looked at you know, eight to ten of them in real detail. So we've still got a lot to learn about probiotics and specificity of them. And titrating, adding them in, that, that seeding uh, process, adding them in, getting specificity in relation to the clinical presentation, skin or, or gut, um, getting as specific as we can, whether it's a plantarum species or raminosis, GG, and titrating, building up the dosage of that. And then we can move into microbiota restoration, prebiotic, uh, dietary changes, exercise, all the things that we've been advocating for wellness and, and health. So it's, it's a uh, multifactorial um, environment that we're working here. Um, I've broken it down into the three phases of protocols. And we can see here that in phase one, it's not just a case of protecting. You know, we've got to be cognizant of other chemical exposures and other um, allergens and toxins, environmentals and molds and, and so forth. And these are all the things as nutritionists and naturopaths, integrated medical physicians, that we're, we're counseling our patients and educating them, motivating them, making those changes. But bearing in mind that that first phase is to clear and reduce toxin levels, LPS being one of them, and using protectin there. We can then move into uh, the phase two of repairing. And there's a number of uh, nutraceuticals and pharmaceuticals and so forth that we may consider. Um, glutamine complexes and herbal antimicrobials, uh, omegas, vitamin D. Uh, starting to make the dietary changes that we know uh, are important uh, in this process. Um, moving towards a more plant-based approach so that we're reducing the consumption of refined um, processed foods, and then restoring that gut health, that balance, that microbiome balance. And again, you know, this is uh, where the probiotics come to the forefront, um, but we've got to feed those with uh, prebiotic being the resistant fiber that we see in food. I think we need about five grams a day of that. Uh, the importance of exercise. Exercise is medicine, uh, movement, motion. Uh, we talked about the importance of sleep earlier, uh, mental relaxation, mindfulness. So it's not a it's not a um, uh, you know a, a one pill fix all scenario. Uh, it is uh, multifactorial and case by case. But I think that uh, what we do have is we do have a significant um, new therapeutic that's going to enable us to really um, 
uh, to help in the, in the battle to uh, restore the health of a lot of our patients uh, indeed. So I have some references here uh, which many of you will be interested in. I want to thank you for listening this evening. Uh, I hope this information has been interesting and provides you all with you know, um, a little bit more understanding of the new tool and new therapeutic approach to gut, liver, brain health, uh, directly targeting LPS, reducing the chronic inflammatory impact. I've recorded this and we're going to make it available through Oborn. So for those of you that uh, wish to, to access it and, and go over again, I'm happy for that. Um, and of course, Oborn is uh, and Protectin is a, a practitioner only uh, product available uh, exclusive to Oborn. Any clinical support, uh, feel free. Uh, email me if you have any questions on, on tonight. I encourage that. Uh, my email is there. Peter M at uh, imiron.com. And uh, once again, thank you very much uh, for this evening and uh, for listening.